Hi, welcome everyone. This is Andrew Conley with Clean Fuels Ohio. We'll give folks just a minute or two here to get logged in, but thanks for taking some time to join us today on this open house with the InterTrust team. So we'll be getting started officially in just a moment. Giving folks just a moment to log on. We'll get started officially in just a second here. Well, we can go ahead and get started and any folks can continue to log on. So I'm Andrew Conley. I'm the Chief Program Officer with Clean Fuels Ohio. Really appreciate folks for taking time out of their day to join us. A uh, couple quick notes that you probably saw as you logged on through Zoom. We are recording this uh, to be able to share with others for future use, as well as streaming live through our Facebook page. So, so just be aware of that. You do, if you're joining us on Zoom, have full audio-visual capabilities, uh, and we want to preserve the bulk of this time for conversation and question and answers with you who are joining us on, on Zoom. So we do want to hear from you, but um, to get things going, I want to turn this over to Robert Adamson with InterTrust, who will introduce the InterTrust team. The InterTrust team will give us a brief demo of their platform, and then we can dive into conversation and discussion with, with you attendees. So with that, Robert, you can take it away. Thank you. I appreciate that, Andrew. And we're very excited to be here today and to share some details about what is the InterTrust platform, which is a cloud and device secure interoperability platform. And today you're gonna to be hearing primarily from Chris Kalima, the VP of Product Management and Sung Chun. He's one of the senior solutions architects within InterTrust. You may also hear from, we have a, a whole host of other subject matter experts depending upon how the Q&A goes that can weigh in as well from InterTrust. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Chris to allow us to get right in and, and begin the process. Thank you so much. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Kalima, as Rob mentioned. I'm the VP of product at InterTrust, responsible for our data platform. Um, and today what we'll be demonstrating is our clean grid solution, which is a way that we've brought together a number of different data that are relevant to grid planning, um, some utility infrastructure, demographic data, and how this data can be used to present a more holistic picture of uh, a specific location or geography, a city, uh, different regions uh, to help planners identify what may be ideal locations to, play, to plant um, new distributed energy resources, whether it be a charging station or a, uh, a PV installation, for example. Um, this tool is really useful for displaying that information and, and unifying that. One of the key um, value propositions of the InterTrust platform is providing this trusted data interoperability, trusted device interoperability through these multi-party systems where different participants, different collaborators uh, may provide different parts of the puzzle. So it could be data from a municipality, for example. It could be demographic data that's being sourced from a commercial provider. It could be some infrastructure details, high voltage lines, medium voltage lines, um, transformer locations that are being provided by utility. It could even be things like traffic data, um, propensity to purchase an electric vehicle, 
uh, things like DMV data, where are our vehicles uh, registered? So all of this really, the platform allows these data owners to bring their data into the platform, into the solution, and then share it in a governed way where they can dictate who has access to that data, what that data can be used for. And really we wanna facilitate engagement and collaboration between uh, the different stakeholders, whether it be the utility, they're trying to respond to um, requests for the placement of new assets or a charging system operator wants to understand where it might be most advantageous to put their new assets. Uh, this is really the premise of the, the clean grid tool. And so my colleague uh, Sung Chun is on the call today and he'll be actually demonstrating the application. Sung? Thanks, Chris. Uh, again, my name is Song Chan. I'm uh, with Intertrust. I lead the solutions team. Um, we've been working on this clean grid solution for a bit, and let me share my screen real quick and give you a quick demonstration of the solution. Um, so for some of you, you might be familiar with the GIS system. This is very similar in terms of displaying the data, but the main concept of what we're providing here is the ability to gain access to a variety of types of data. Uh, whether it be your own data, maybe it might be third-party data, or it could be um, uh, you know, some data from the utilities directly. Uh, so in this scenario here, what we have is I could just quickly demonstrate and go through some of the data points that we have access to. Uh, we do have some privately, uh, I'm sorry, publicly available data throughout the, the space of the energy. So this is a high level, high level to mid-level voltage lines throughout the, the state of California or in the Bay Area. Uh, but we also have some third-party demographic data and also um, uh, EV charging data. So this is, you see these green dots, these are the existing uh, EV charging data throughout the, throughout the Bay Area. But once we zoom in into San Francisco, we can start enabling other types of data. Uh, these are, some of these data points are coming from the municipalities of San Francisco. Some of them is coming from uh, third-party um, analytics companies or some are just publicly available. For example, we have some parking data. These are the parking structures throughout the city of San Francisco. Um, we also have access to which buildings are commercial versus residential, uh, we, you know, how many stories a, a building contains. Um, and we also have some, some sample data from PG&E, which is the local utility provider here in California. Uh, so we have some uh, low voltage lines. We can identify the load capacity of each of these lines. Um, and we also have uh, the uh, solar hosting ca capacity as well. So this determines how much uh, solar energy can be fed back into the grid without disruptions to the uh, existing infrastructure. And then finally, we have uh, individual household uh, garages throughout the city. Now, some of the use cases that we've come across here in San Francisco, one of the more um, recent one is around the parking infrastructure and uh, adoption to EV uh, installations, uh, charging installations. And so one of the mandates in San Francisco recently was to convert about 10% of all of the parking spaces within parking lots uh, to uh, EV charging stalls. And so one of the challenges that the city faces here is first being able to work with the utilities to identify whether even each of these locations can support those uh, requirements. And so for example, here where we, where we combine data from the uh, utilities in conjunction with uh, uh, the details from the municipalities, we can see and determine which of these uh, parking lots can easily be converted and immediately be converted to install these EV uh, uh, charging stalls or uh, identify those that might require some additional infrastructure upgrades from the local utilities. Um, we also have a tool, uh, one of our partners tool that allows you to do real-time grid calculations. It, ta it, could, it takes a localized uh, grid information along with uh, how much load you expect at that location and we could come back and within minutes, we could come back and return back a report similar to this that will identify you know, how much of an impact that will have on the local grid. Uh, so this is not only just uh, giving a quick validation whether this location can support additional EV charging stations, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, this process typically takes weeks to months. And if you look at the number of uh, uh, parking lots throughout the city, you know, we're looking at a huge in investment from not just a city, 
and each of the individual uh, parking lot owners, but also for the PG&E to be able to handle this uh, large load of uh, requests. Um, so this is one of the tool sets that we have and you know, some of the use cases, same concept can also apply for uh, any type of assets. It doesn't have to be EV charging pools. It could be um, smart meters. It could be uh, any type of assets that you wanna add into the infrastructure. We could do these real-time calculations against the grid, grid data. Now, the another use case that we have here is more on the consumer level. Um, as EV adoption continues to grow, one of the challenges that the utilities will face is identifying whether the existing infrastructure can handle the extra load. Now, as you can see here, these are all the garages throughout the city of San Francisco. And one of the challenges is what happens if every one of these households decides to buy an electric vehicle? And you can think that imagine that each of these garages will likely have a, a you know carport installation, uh, uh, EV charging installed, which again will introduce additional load to the grid. Um, again, so this is one of the the use cases that the utilities are using this tool for is to identify, you know, and identify these hotspots and then potentially introduce some sort of a, a, a contingency plan to help address these type of issues that might come up in the future. Uh, whether this, that be you know, proactively upgrading the infrastructure or possibly introducing storage at the localized location, or maybe even introducing some sort of program where the uh, consumers will have to off, uh, where they can only charge a certain time period. Uh, so again, this is just another demonstration of how we can interoperate with the different types of data available. Uh, the more, uh, again, some of this data points is coming from third-party analytics companies. Some of this data is coming from the utilities. And again, some of this data will be coming from the municipalities themselves. And the last piece I want to demonstrate here is uh, just give you a quick glance of our production environment in Germany. Uh, this is a uh, example of some of the uh, solar data that we have access to from a third party vendor. And here we're looking at the city of Essen and you can see all these uh, colored uh, buildings here. And what, what, what they've done is they've analyzed uh, the rooftops and determined which rooftops are suitable for installing solar panels. Now, since we have access to a variety of different data from different providers, we can start doing, um, you know, creating some metrics or analytics on this data. So for example, um, based on the data that we have access to, we identified that 56% of the rooftops are suitable for installing solar panels. Now, if we did install solar panels throughout the city of Essen, um, all on top of all of these 56% of the rooftops, we could potentially generate 1,000 gigawatts, over 1,000 gigawatts of energy just purely on solar. And again, that, that calculation translates to about 535 metric tons of CO2 reduction just by converting over to solar from the existing uh, energy sources. Uh, but that that's pretty much concludes the demonstration. Um, I was told to limit it to a short time period. Um, we do have a lot of other use cases. If there are other interests uh, in exploring more of what we can offer, uh, please feel to contact us and uh, we could definitely uh, uh, give you a, a wider depth of demonstration. Yeah, thank you, Song. That was a great demo. Uh, any other comments from the uh, InterTrust team in terms of uh, clarifications or setup you want for the discussion? Well, not hearing any, I want to open <laughs> up the, the floor here to our participants. I, I know um, I have some questions of my own, but I want to make it clear that folks can unmute themselves and ask questions directly about the, the tool, its use cases, data sets, you know, any, anything from the InterTrust team we want to hear from you and discuss. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable verbalizing those, we are monitoring the, the chat functions as well. So you can feel free to chat your questions to us and, and I can play the, the moderator and voice of the audience, but really want to um, open that up to, to the audience. So I'm gonna be quiet for just a second and. Uh, if no questions are forthcoming, I'll ask a couple of my own. Hi, this is Dr. Phil Keys with uh, InterTrust. I work here in corporate communications. 
just want to mention that uh, beyond uh, some of the people you met, we also have uh, Dave Mayer on here on the call, who is our CTO. So we're open to any sorts of questions that you may have. Go ahead, Sarah. I see your hand up. Hey, um, so Sarah, I work at Brightware and Energy Tech Startup. It's less of a question, but potentially could be part of a conversation. So in Ohio through ODOT, all metro planning organizations and ODOT offices have street light um, data subscriptions. And I know they just released um, their EV charging data sets based on cell phone usage. So just seeing that, you know, that might be an opportunity um, you know, to work with governments in Ohio, specifically on, you know, this, because um, the whole mapping of where assets should be is such a hot topic, and that might be a natural partnership to consider. Yeah, I think uh, there's a wide variety of consumer, even telemetric, telemetrics data come from the automobiles. Um, I think all of those can play in as another data set that we could introduce easily into the platform and then be able to share that data with uh, third parties or other members. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, or Chris, do you know if we have any sort of similar uh, experiences in Germany where uh, some of the municipalities there are showing some of their data? Yeah, I think from the from Germany, there's definitely a, um, each municipality provides kind of have their own use cases. Um, you know, each each of them have a different uh, set of assets that they want to introduce into the grid. And that's where we could kind of dive into and in maybe in a separate session more about details about how we could do grid calculations. Um, some of the tools that we offer there allows you to add any asset into the into the grid. And then we could dynamically uh, investigate what impact that has on the grid. And it's a pretty cool tool that you kind of visually see uh, what impact it'll have on the existing grid infrastructure uh, whenever you add a, 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 add a point on the map and, and see, add a load to that and see what happens. Sarah, to your, um, the, the information that's being published from Ohio Dot, I was doing a little bit of digging around. Do you, do you have a, a pointer to that resource? That, that's, that's definitely an interesting, you know, adding data, data sets like this can be really interesting, especially if they're dynamic data sets and they can sort of connect into the platform. It gives you more, you know, more parameters to be able to play around with, uh, with capabilities. Great, got it. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's been a few years, I'd say three years since they started the partnership, but it's just drastically changed like demand um, uh, forecasting for local governments and considering transportation improvements and as well as multimodal. That's great, that's great, thanks. Yeah, and maybe Thomas, to your point, uh, you talked about dynamic data sets. Can you maybe shed a little more light on better and worse kind of data sets or more ideal data sets uh, for, for the InterTrust platform? Um, well, I guess sort of going back to the essential problem that we're, we're addressing with the, with the platform here, um, starting at the high level, we, we've been working with a number of, of it actually, the conversations really started with electric utilities. Um, we have a couple of significant investors in the company that are, one of them is the largest energy electric utility in Germany. Another one is a major electric retailer in, in Australia. The, the, the challenge that those, those organizations was, fa was facing is, um, you know, it's been primarily driven by the upcoming wave of electric vehicles. Um, but there's a whole bunch of dynamics that are making it harder as a as a big electric utility to plan out and predict where to build in, build out infrastructure. And part of the challenge is um, it, part of the challenge is it's it's hard to predict where where this information or where new data sets are going to come from. For example, um, how far can you how far can you really go to help improve your insights in planning out where electric vehicles are gonna get purchased. Who's gonna purchase them? Can you collect social and demographic information to help give you hints and be able to project so you can make your capital investments in, in the grid in the right places. 
And then sort of adding another layer of complexity is, well, what's happening with distributed energy resources, things like pe people putting solar panels on their roofs or, um, or investors coming along and saying, hey, I've got this field, I've got this field over here. I want, I want to put up a bunch of solar panels or I, you know, I want to develop a, 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 wind, a wind turbine farm. Um, they want to they be able, these, these independent companies are coming along and trying to figure out how to invest in generating capacity that they could contribute and sell and, and make, some, make some money on the side while, while helping sort of lower carbon footprint. So um, the challenge is, the challenge that we saw with, with, with these initial partners is they couldn't predict where the data was coming from. It's coming in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. It's coming, it's coming in maybe from um, standard sources like you know, databases, SQL databases. It may be coming from less structured data like, like simple tables or flat files kinds of information. There may be certain types of, generally what people would think of as unstructured data, things and documents and such. Um, what we what we we built here is a and and sort of the the interesting thing to the folks who are in the IT side of of the of the problem, we built a simplifying framework that lets you make a build an easy direct connection into that into those data sources, in order to present it in one nice neat little user interface. You can build things like the like the this mapping application that we just showed. Um, Mapping is is only one way that you might want to look at that sort of data. It it happens to be in the case of of planning planning grid and delivering electric services to to communities. Geography is is probably the primary interface, but this can also apply to um, this can also apply to more classic you know classic information. So one part is these organizations couldn't predict where the data is coming from. So we built a, a framework that's tolerant of being able to adopt and inherit and collect data from different sources. The next barrier that we saw is great. One company has a data set um, that another company wants. Does that second, does, does that first company with the data set really trust what the, what the next company is going to do with it? And oftentimes, and we absolutely saw this with electric utilities, there are a lot of companies that would love to get access at in essential data that's inside the electric utility. And right now, for all sorts of different reasons, from political reasons, just to security reasons, they don't wanna share that. One of the things that we've done with this system is not only enable the sharing of information, but also the ability to control and limit access in a way that other parties can come in and look at specific data sets without adding any sort of risk that, that data will leak or that data can be copied away from the application and used in, in some other place. So we pro provide what, what, what we call a governance framework on top of this information so that you can control and regulate as the owner of the data, who gets to see the data from the other parties and still give the other parties, the ability to have freedom to run their analytics, run their machine learning models, run predictive analytics, forecasting models, and things like that against a data set without necessarily being able to walk away with the data set and use it for whatever purposes, nefarious purposes or purposes that weren't intended. Um, so I realize that's kind of a, a, a long answer to your question, but but fundamentally back to the original question, yeah, we're we we've designed this this system to be able to solve one of the biggest barriers which is access and integration across multiple different sorts of data sort data types and data sources while still providing the owners of that information the control and the ability to regulate who really gets access to that information in a fair and balanced way i mean I'll step back and, and sort of leave you with the thought that ultimately I think the next generation of these kinds of problems, the kinds of problems that Clean, Fuel, Clean Fuels Ohio is trying to solve, that, uh, that also projects like the I-80 electrification project, these are challenges that are no longer controlled and solved by any one entity. And the only way that we're going to be able to move forward and actually collaborate and successfully implement some of these types of programs is a collabor collaboration framework and the collaboration depends on people sharing data. And so our ultimate objective here is to enable 
the building and creation and management of data ecosystems that facilitate that kind of collaboration. Yeah, that's a great and helpful frame in which to, to view this. Um, I'm going to pause for additional comments or questions from, from our viewers. Otherwise, I have a couple of follow-up questions on, this, on some of what you just described. Any, any questions that folks either want to chat or vocalize? Uh, while, while folks are thinking of additional questions, um, certainly that kind of like cross collaboration and data integration is key for all the barriers and opportunities that, that you just alluded to. Certainly, you know, obviously one of the main inputs for uh, electric vehicle planning is, is where that power is, as Sung was showing us on the, the San Francisco view. Have you found best practices in, in working with the utilities to get that data. I know that has been a challenge. Obviously the platform solves for some of the privacy and security concerns, but just do you have some thoughts or best practices from either national or international projects that, that you've seen in working with utilities to get at that data? I guess I'd say for, from, from my perspective, um, the practices are really different in the different regions. And if you're looking at it from the perspective of the, of the electric utility, the dynamic in Europe and the dynamic is in Germany is different from the dynamic in France, which is different from the UK and, and so on. Um, the, the people that we've seen most of aggressively addressing the notion of building a framework to collaborate across data. I would say today, it feels like Germany has been, has been sort of out in front there. Um, Eon is the, is the big, one of the biggest energy utilities in, in the world and, and certainly the dominant in, in, uh, in Germany. They've, they are collaborating with automakers in order to share data to help get a sort of better better control and the balance between you know where are electric vehicles going what are they what shape are they taking what form are they taking um other types of things like what's happening with with fleets uh, electrified fleets um and and so in terms in terms of best practices or policies I, I, to me it's it's re, it's really early days yet everybody's a little bit guarded with their information and so what you could i guess sort of a best practice I could say is don't feel, don't feel um, that you have to basically open up all of the data to partners and don't feel that all, all the data needs to be dumped onto the table to be shared with and people, you know, allow, allow people to run away with it because we don't know how data is necessarily going to get used. So the best thing you can do is, is provide data in a controlled and governed, governed kind of a framework that, um, enables that even potentially enables that data to be sort of rolled back and restricted in the future. If you decide that, oh, oh okay, like we've, 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 we've exposed a little bit too much data par to partners in the old days. And I'll point to something like Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook incident. Here was, here, here was a, an organization that was doing some very valid kind of educate, you know, educational research on, um, on Facebook data. Once that data got out in the hands of Cambridge Analytica, it got picked up and used for all sorts of other purposes that were never the intention of sharing that data. What do you do then? Well, unfortunately, if you have bad actors, there's not much you can do. And the approach by having sort of a live flow of information directly from source data from the different parties, um, together with the management framework that enables people to work in a, in a sort of safe safe area and interact with the data in a sort of a think of it like a uh, like like you know in 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 a in a in a bio, biological lab you sort of have those those boxes that you have to reach in with the gloves and stuff like that the sort of safe rooms we provide a sort of an environment like that that enables people to get in and manipulate the data and work with it in a secure environment to be able to do analytics and get their results but not enabling somebody to walk out of the room with some potentially you know potentially toxic data I just want to add one thing to your comments, Tom. I would say in terms of best practices, it's, it's great to start with a concrete use case 
because it's very easy to get into the data like void and, and realm where you don't know what data will be useful. And so sometimes you'll get a request, we need data. And it starts a process where maybe the floodgates open, people are trying to expose a lot of data, most of which will be unused or is, is not valuable for a particular application. So I do think trying to understand what parts or portions of that data would be required in order to fulfill whatever the outcome may be. Now, an example of this is, um, you know, the request in, in California, we have this um, capacity maps, right? So can a capacity map, an existing capacity map serve as a proxy for the general availability of the grid to support uh, particular resources? Now, obviously the accuracy of these, the frequency with which they're produced uh, may not be sufficient, but could it be enough of a coarse level of data to say, you know, this, this uh, 10 story apartment building with a multi-level parking garage where they want to put 20 different uh, chargers in, low voltage chargers in, uh, is not going to be feasible given this capacity map. We know that it, like, it's a very, um, it can be determined from that limited bit of information. I don't need to know that the line runs this way and it has these transformers with these properties. Um, so there's a level of detail and that's typically where the utilities get sensitive to the amount of information that they're sharing. So I think, you know, again, considering some of these things, is that enough to determine maybe to 80% that this is a viable location? And then you can proceed with a connection request knowing that there's a higher level of confidence that this location uh, is a, a viable one. And so, again, I think identifying those use cases is very important uh, because it will help you to identify which pieces of that data actually matter. I was I was going to add to that the 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 idea the 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 particular challenge of figuring out where to put charging stations and par, tr collections of charging posts is actually is actually a really interesting one because that does bring a a, a big load um, a big load back to the back to the electric utility that they have to that they have to deal with um, that problem is actually addressed by many utilities today. And if you go inside and see how they solve that problem, they wind up assimilating a bunch of potentially even paper maps and paper documents about what, what resources, what capacity is where, and they go through and, and sort of plan that out. Um, in our experience, um, we've seen uh, electric utilities that deal with it in that way. The people who are running and building out the grids, it can take them on the order of of, of six months, um, and this is this this data is actually pre-COVID. Who knows how much longer it takes when people aren't even working in the office, getting access to files and paperwork. Um, six months to be able to get get through the decision making and be able to provide feedback to someone who wants to develop a charging lot as to whether there's sufficient capacity there. Potentially, if there's not, what are going to be the costs to build that out? And if you are if you are a fast moving organization that's really trying to build up charging charging capacity, just waiting for an answer six months it it doesn't it doesn't work anymore. It's just that's not a satisfactory answer, um, because you multiply that decision over all the different requests that are going to come to try to hit some of these these uh, carbon targets by say twenty thirty, and you can you can sort of do the math. There's just not enough people shuffling enough paper to be able to come up with those answers. So again, really providing an integrated framework that lets you absorb the different, you know, the, the different kinds of data points in an online fashion just sort of reduces the latency of making these decisions and, and making these plans. And, uh, and, and, and that's really, I think that's, that's gonna be integral to, to us hitting, hitting our, our um, carbon reduction targets, whatever region we're talking about. Yeah, so diving more into the use case front, that electric vehicle charging planning use case is certainly one that's uh, top of mind for Clean Fuels Ohio and, and probably many of, of our attendees today. So obviously I could rattle off a, a handful of data sets uh, that are top of my mind, but I'd be curious to hear from the inner trust expertise in terms of 
what kind of data sets have you found most germane or relevant to that planning? Obviously, there's the capacity maps that that Chris was speaking to and, and Sung was showing in, in San Francisco. There's you know, a number of other data sets, what would you kind of think are some of the key primary ones that are generally ready available in, in most regions? Sung, could, could I maybe ask your help on that since you've been yeah, most I think close uh, to some of the areas that we definitely, especially around fleet or even uh, you know, consumer level uh, details is, is identifying, like I said, when, where to install these charge points. You know, for the most part, you know, utilities they typically go to the the obvious ones like shopping malls, maybe near freeways. Um, you know, areas that are that have a lot of uh, traffic. So one of the challenges that they have is just again beyond that. What where is the next place that we can install these uh, EV infrastructures? And some of this is we're we're trying to help. Um, like I said, with some of our partnership with the um, the EV manufacturers, um, maybe if we could get some of their data and provide that information to identify where, you know, anonymous data where majority of these EVs are parking where they need charging, but there's no uh, infrastructure nearby. So things like that can help uh, determine what type of uh, uh, locations that we want to specify, uh, where we want to install these. Another one could be, um, especially in the fleet inf infrastructure, is identifying, you know, expansion and growth. So you might identify a location that you want to install uh, a fleet, have a, have a fleet service section, uh, location, but you have to think about what happens in the future when you want to expand. Can the infrastructure that's already planned for there uh, support the growth without major costs? Um, so that could be another uh, asp a data point that you want to introduce here is that, you know, identifying the location, the proper location that can support the growth as your uh, fleet continues to grow. Um, but again, it just depends on the use cases. Um, again, for commercial, again, I think from the commercial side, it's going to be more, or consumer side, it's going to be more on, on getting some telemetric, telematic uh, data from, from some of these vehicles would be very useful. Yeah, yeah we can, we, we've seen, you can, you can model um, things like car trip information based on data points from, well, um, some of the some of the big ride sharing services can give you some pretty strong hints about where people are going and what time of day they're going and where they're going to that kind of stuff potentially yeah as as sung mentioned the automakers themselves are starting to collect a lot more telematic information super super sensitive by the way talk about get it stepping into the privacy right. you know the, the the privacy um situation where you've really really got to protect that mm -hmm. information ensure that individuals individual um, travel and locations that don't wind up getting disclosed in the process. Um, so there's car trip information. The other interesting one, I mean, there's also telematics information for fleets, you know, talking with one of the large cities out here on the West coast of the U S is um, they're really interested. They're interested in getting uh, telematics information from the, from you know, trucking companies and, and distribution companies and, and, and people running fleets where you've got, trucks and warehouses and distribution centers where trucks might be might be conceivably charging up overnight figure out how long are those trips what's the potential capacity charging capacity of those trucks are they going to need to deal with a bunch of a bunch of big semi trucks running out of running out of juice in the middle of you know middle of downtown san francisco and you know in the afternoon um what do they have to do in terms of like booster uh, potential booster stations along the way to get people back and forth. Because, I mean, what we see here, at least in, in, in California, is the distribution centers are, are like, you know, 100, 100 miles away from, from where, they're, where they're dropping their payloads every, every day. Um, so you got a lot of long trips going on. Um, how do you electrify? How do you electrify or actually even find the right kind of fuel that's appropriate um, to be able to make those kinds of trips? Or do you have to change where you're where you're citing warehouses, which isn't likely going to happen. Um, those are those are those are interesting data points to um, to be able to absorb. The other one that we've seen in practice, um, and we've seen at least in our experience with the partners where we've launched this so far, municipalities have good information that's very helpful in terms of the buildings, like residential um, information, um, right down to what's you know. The size of houses, value of houses is an indicator of signal. 
whether the house has a garage or not is a signal is a signal as to whether there's likelihood of an early EV adopter or later EV adopter um, and sort of individual like income information for particular neighborhoods. Um, that is it's that social and, and demographic information that becomes really, really important in understanding one. Who are the likely people that are just naturally going to go to go to EV um, adoption, and then for those regions and areas uh, where there really needs to be more of an incentive or a push, where can incentives that are coming from, you know, say, government entities or um, or typically government entities, where can those incentives be best placed to drive EV adoption? And, and sort of help help lower the barriers to adopt EV adoption in, in certain communities where right now it, it's 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 you know going to be difficult without some incentives. So uh, the social and demographic information is is really valuable. But again, once again, that's when it becomes important to provide a, a you know respect and and privacy controls over that data so that individual information is is absolutely never never ever exposed. Um, those those seem to be the dominant those seem to be the dominant data data sets. I suppose you could just it it becomes like a, a rabbit hole you could go down. Um, at some point, what what effect does uh, weather have on loads for houses and things like that? I mean, EVs are certainly gonna gonna be taking a lot of it's pulling a lot of load off of the off of the electric grid, but um, you know what are what are other things that are going to affect it? Weather and climate history. Um, you know, how do you manage when somebody's got to charge their car and turn their heater on full blast because it's a, it's going to be a very very cold winter day. Um, all of that, you know, integrating all of that data is not just that it's it is the domain of data scientists, who's a very very good profession to have right now, but but uh, but also access to that data in a way that that can be action actionable. Um, it's very, very hard for those people to quickly get access to enough information to satisfy that exploration. And fundamentally, that's what we're trying to build here with the with the, these these data ecosystems. Yeah, and can certainly appreciate the value of that. We've worked with the Ohio DOT Drive Ohio program to release two different reports. One looking at uh, motorist uh, corridors on interstates, U.S. routes, and state routes, uh, and, and looked at a lot of the data sets you're describing, but in that kind of static published report, one-time, mm -hmm. you know, view, whereas this is more of a live dynamic tool that, you know, is continually updated and, and uh, able to be modified. So that certainly adds a lot of value. And we just released uh, this week, uh, or the state did, uh, and Cleanfields Ohio participated as a co-author, a uh, freight electrification study mapping out those distribution centers and freight corridors with a view towards a number of those things you mentioned in terms of freight electrification. So you can certainly see how the InterTrust platform would add a lot of more live up to the minute modeling and, and, and data analytics capabilities. So um, I, I think those those reports themselves are both live through the Drive Ohio program at, at ODOT that you can um, circle back to and I can drop some links in here and, and speak to some of the data sets, whether that be um, DOT and MPO level traffic count data, you know, uh, there's Ohio BMV has worked with ODOT to publish the um, monthly updated dashboard on alternative fuel vehicle registrations, which in Ohio functionally means in the motorist category EVs, you know, so you can mm -hmm. get down to the five digit zip level of, of where all those are registered to at, at the very least and, and stack that with some of the grid capacity, parking locations and, and other data sets that, that you're speaking to. Um, so I think one of the topic areas that's been touched on but not explored thoroughly in, in your comments is that kind of extra security features of the um, InterTrust platform and environment. So is there anything you'd wanna add to the comments that have been made so far in terms of the additional uh, components of security and privacy that are built into the InterTrust platform? Chris, maybe could I turn to you for input? <clears throat> or yeah, we also sure. have Dave here too, could yeah. chime in. Yeah, I, I can yeah. give a, a, a quick stab here. So. 
I think one of the things that Tom has been mentioning, right, his sort of uh, virus box where you're not going to unleash something, uh, it's, it's in a secure, contained environment. Um, that component is our secure execution environment. And one of the values there is that you're able to retain custody of your data. So what does that mean as a data owner? It means in order to provide this analysis, I don't need to provide a link for someone to download this data to their own device, their own cloud environment. Um, I'm not handing it off on a thumb drive, sending it over email in some Excel file where I've lost custody of that data, right? Now, why is this important? Once you've lost custody of that data, you can't govern it. Doesn't, you know, maybe there's a contractual agreement that's in place, but that end recipient can create a digital copy, share it with other people. You don't necessarily know where that data will egress beyond um, that initial send. And so the execution environment allows you to bring those workloads, whether it be an application, some type of model analysis into the platform. The platform will then grant access to this data to that service on behalf of a user or a client. And it can then go and run itself on the platform. So data is actually never egressing beyond the platform itself. And, but yet it allows you to start to interact. And these could be operational workloads. So it could be something that's consuming data on an ongoing basis. You know, maybe it's generating a report on a daily basis. Maybe this is something that's much more um, uh, higher frequency. Maybe that, you know, every hour, every 10 minutes, five minutes, something's happening. But it also enables these types of discovery workflows where someone as a data scientist or someone who is an analyst can come in, launch a Jupyter notebook or some type of interactive environment and start to work and play with that data with the, the gloves on in the box, right? So that's really one of the nice features about the platform because typically in a lot of these uh, cases, you really just see access control. It's the fact that Rob can download this data set. And to, to touch on that, you know, we do within the platform record all of these events. So we do have an audit service that is running in parallel all of these events, whether it be myself granting Rob access, Rob querying that data set, all of this is captured as an immutable audit record. And so there is a history of activity that has been performed in the platform that can also be used um, in retrospect, right? So that's, that's another feature that we provide, um, but it, you know, that, that only shows you what has occurred. It um, doesn't necessarily prevent someone from passing data along. So that's really where our secure execution environment comes into play. Um, you know, everyone that interacts with the system needs to authenticate. Uh, we can do things like integrate with existing identity providers. So if an, ex or an organization has an active directory um, repository of users and that's where they manage it, we can use those credentials to authenticate in the platform. Um, so much in the way that we can go out and connect to existing data stores, we can also go out and connect to existing identities um, so that you don't need to fully replicate your organization within the InterTrust platform. So we can facilitate those types of interactions as well. And that's really nice, particularly for IT departments that are looking you know, to use their existing management tools to grant access to data. Um, so yeah, those are some of the, the features. I don't know, Dave, if there's anything um, you'd like to add uh, to that. You're, you're on mute currently, Dave. Uh, you might want to talk a little bit about uh, the identity, the fine-grained identity and access management features that we do have uh, right at the outset of design of the, the, the platform. We provided uh, very uh, the capability for very fine-grained access control, just about every data asset and supervisory asset in the, the uh, platform uh, can have its own access policy. Uh, and uh, we have uh, fine-grained, uh, you could consider it something like uh, attribute-based uh, access management for, for uh, individuals and other entities, which could be programs and, and uh, 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 things of that sort um, that you can screen out or have effectively whitelists or blacklists for, for, for uh, access to any of those fine-grained uh, assets. 
Yeah, so really what I'm, my main takeaway from all of those comments is like to some of Thomas's earlier comments, that kind of security, privacy and access and ingress, egress of data was like the, the structural engineering from the start of this tool was really baked in and, and one of the main things you all are trying to solve for. That's Yeah, that's exactly correct. I mean, I think the, the, the three pillars of the platform, the InterTrust platform and the clean grid uh, solution, you know, this is an application that's running on top of the platform, but the premise is we want to provide trust, whether that be through, you know, security, uh, transparency, um, a number of different ways that you can do that. But we want parties that may not necessarily be able to trust one another to have a trusted engagement. Um, we want to provide interoperability, whether it be different data sources, you know, some of Tom mentioned a relational database, a flat file, wherever that data may reside, um, as well as, you know, upstream or downstream, depending on which way you're looking, I guess, uh, with existing software and tools. So if you're using a business intelligence tool, Tableau, if, you know, whatever you may be using, that interoperability with your existing tool set. So these are things that the platform in general provides. And then we've worked with our customers in energy to develop domain specific solutions like the clean grid tool. And so that collaboration that that allows between these different stakeholders and these data economies, these data ecosystems, that's really um, the, the premise of the platform. We wanna enable those trusted interactions, that trusted interoperability with these different collaborators that are working in these emerging ecosystems. Well, I, I found this fascinating and very helpful, a deeper dive into the InterTrust platform. I'm gonna open it up again to any additional comments or questions from the audience, whether chatted uh, or, or verbalized here, but really appreciate the InterTrust team for, for walking us through this uh, great platform that you all have. Not hearing any active questions right now. Is there anything anyone from the InterTrust team would want to add in, in summation as we're running close to our, our time here? No, I'm just, uh, yeah. appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate the opportunity to to be able to to share this with with uh, you all and with the the Clean Fuel Clean Fuels Ohio membership. Um, has been, I think, good, good, productive hour. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to share share more information as we're as we're working on this and collaborate with the other members of the of the organization and further this discussion along. Ultimately, we are really in we we really do support the mission of Clean Fuels Ohio and all of the different organizations that are trying to trying to tackle the problem in particular of moving to electric uh, vehicle electrification, potentially alternative clean fuels. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about here, but in certain other countries, people are talking about hydrogen, you know, as a, as a, as a fuel alternative, um, you know, there's similar, similar, but, but, you know, a lot of different variables in something like that. Um, some of the common, common elements that need to be studied in terms of where the trips are happening and what kind of vehicles there are and, and where to, you know, where to build supply points and things like that, all all relate. So, um, yeah, I appreciate. I think we we all from the InterTrust side of the the table here really appreciate the opportunity to to meet with you all and and uh, and share this. Looking forward to collaborating more. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any other final comments? Yeah, I guess um, one thing I'd just like to add is that um, this, uh, what we built is actually based off of 20 years of experience working, over 20 years of experience working with uh, valuable types of data. And so, um, you know, we, in both uh, R&D as well as in operations. So it's something that we live and breathe and uh, look forward to be able to sharing with other people going forward. 
Well, it certainly seems extremely powerful and useful. We'll be featuring more information about the InterTrust platform in our transportation solutions showcase portion of our website and, and doing some follow-up activities with the InterTrust team and, and some of you all who have, have registered and participated today. So really appreciate everyone's time and, and the information and discussion today and look forward to following up with all of you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.